Hey there folks, welcome back. Uh, Dan Clark from Arcane Botanica and as promised another installment on uh, some plant identification and this continues the series on eucalypts uh, from an Australian perspective. Uh, lecture one covered the, the three genera that comprise uh, the eucalypts of Australia and as promised of uh, done some additional lectures and this is a one on end gofra so just going to cover angophora in this one going to dive straight into it because i'm trying to keep these on the short side i'm probably not going to succeed with that but uh, hopefully this helps you anyway and thanks for tuning in if you're here uh angophora it's sort of the best genus to start with because as i say there there's only 10 to 13 species uh, i've said in new south wales what i really mean is that can be extended to the whole eastern seaboard or the um, eastern states of Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria. Uh, they go a fair bit inland, but not too far inland into the central parts. But uh, the lumpers think some of the species are the same and can't really be differentiated morphologically, even though they grow in different areas. But 10 to 13 species is all you have to worry about. Um, I think if you jump on Euclid, they only recognise 10. So Angophora is a good place to start compared to the 700 to 900 eucalypts that you've got to get familiar with. Well, at least a lot of them if you want to learn about um, the variety in eucalyptus. So a good place to start with Angophora. Just repeating some of the features from lecture one. If you haven't seen that, have a look at that. Uh, this is lecture two. Um, but I just threw in some additional things that I should have really had in lecture one, but I'll throw those in now. So just remember the juvenile leaves are opposite in Angophora and the adult leaves are pretty much opposite to sub opposite. Sometimes you can look at something like Angophora costata and the leaves don't look completely opposite. They're a little bit sub opposite, but they're never really truly alternate or they, they don't really look well and truly gapped in an alternate or disjunct arrangement they they tend to stick close to the opposite or sub opposite um side of things so watch out for that i've thrown this in and some people might argue with me on this but i find the leaves are not overly odorous they don't have that really strong typical eucalyptus scent especially if i compare it to and and this might be a bit extreme but if i compare it to something like eucalyptus radiata or eucalyptus uh, piperita to peppermints or um, something like eucalyptus macartheri which has a very strong cinnamon smell i don't get much out of angophora leaves when i give them a good crush and smell them there's a little bit of odor there but there's not much some people could happily argue with me on that uh, i don't have the strongest nose out there but I just find the leaves, compared to eucalypts, are not strongly eucalyptus are not strongly odorous. So just another feature there that to me differentiates them. Don't forget the conspicuously staminate flowers, and they do have five small petals and sepals, which are not fused into a bud cap, and they're not shed as a bud cap. So they don't have a calyptra or an operculum. That's what differentiates them from eucalyptus and corymbia. They don't have that fusion of the petals and the sepals into a cap that is shed. This is a fruiting stage, but just on the end of the fruits here, you've got what we call the, the remnants of the sepals and the petals. They've sort of been reduced to these sort of woody teeth, but they are there. They're still there in the fruiting stage. In a eucalyptus or a corymbia fruit, you're not going to have any sign of these sepals and petals sort of hanging around because they've been shed. So that's just a major difference with Angophora. So look for those staminate flowers, uh, numerous stamens surrounding one carpal, no calyptra. It's it's sort of a, a proper sort of flower bud arrangement and it just opens up as a, as a flower. And uh so what some people might say is just going back to that is you could say angophora have complete flowers where you've got all the whorls present the sepals the petals the stamens and the carpels and in eucalyptus and corymbia they're incomplete flowers when the flowers open up you've only got the sepals and the um sorry sorry you've only got the stamens and the carpels the sexual parts remaining and that's what we call an incomplete flower where 
you've got some typical parts that are missing and eucalyptus is a very very good example of plants that have incomplete flowers remember the fruits are capsule uh, again you can call it a gum nut but it's a capsule and it's got these conspicuous longitudinal ribs which terminate in the sepal and the petal teeth so normally when you go around you can count five to ten projections like i think if you went around this one you might get more than five you can see five there and five there so that's meant to be the sepal teeth but You've also got the petals uh, forming these uh, or the, these ribs as well um, in the fruiting stage. So, you know, you could have five to ten teeth around there. But again, that name Angophra means it's ancient Greek meaning sort of vessel bearing or goblet bearing. So uh, it, it looks like an ancient Greek, you know, wine goblet. And it, it does a very good job of doing that. So Angophra means sort of goblet bearing, vessel bearing. So some beautiful fruits there. Um, so just remember those features. Now, what I should have pointed out in lecture one was uh, the nature of inflorescences. And I'm, I'm a bit remiss that I, I left this out. But in Angophra, the flowers are well and surely produced at the terminals or at the terminals of the branches. And it's what we call terminal inflorescences. That is a feature shared with Corimbia. Corimbia do that as well. They've got the flowers well and surely out there on the terminals of the branches and when we look at any flowering plant we look at where the flowers are produced are they produced in sort of terminal clusters what might be panicles or or corums and that word corimbia is meant to relate to corums a, a, an inflorescence that's sort of got a, a broad umbrella sort of shape and all the flowers are out there or are they more mainly produced in the leaf axils? And we call that sort of axillary inflorescences. And when you look at eucalyptus, they've got a bit of a mixture because there's so many species there, but a lot of the eucalyptus, eucalyptus produce their flowers in the leaf axils in these clusters called umbilasters. And all three genera are described as having umbilasters, but in Angophra and Corimbia, they're produced well and surely beyond the foliage at the terminals this is the fruiting stage but you can see that the flowers would have been well and surely beyond the foliage they're right there at the at the last you know terminal part of the plant and there's no sort of leaves beyond so when angophras and corymbias come into full flower you can just see how the very edges of the canopy get covered in flowers those beautiful flower and corymbias the, that go red and orange and pink you see the flowers well and surely out there. Same for Angophra, and that's a feature they sort of share. So I really should have pointed that out. Uh, when you see these eucalypts with um, terminal inflorescences, and some eucalypt species do it as well, eucalyptus, but a lot of the time the flowers are down in the leaf axils. So just look for that in Angophra, and I should have pointed that out in the first lecture. Um, just the bark in Angophra, Remember, we've only got 10 to 13 species. The bark's either smooth, and when eucalypts have a mostly smooth trunk, you can't really pull any bark off except for maybe really small sort of shedding fragments. They tend to get tend to get called a gum. And when they're um, yeah, so any eucalypt with a smooth trunk mainly is called a gum. And the other condition in Angophra is smooth, full bark fibrous. So they can have this sort of, it's not an iron bark sort of trunk, but it's a, it's sort of a something to me which resembles something like a mahogany in eucalypts. It's got this sort of brown to brown gray fibrous bark. Uh, I can't think of any other conditions in Angophra, such as iron bark or part bark, where you might have half a chunk of fibrous bark and half a chunk, uh, the rest of the tree has sort of smooth bark, something like Eucalyptus pilularis, where you've got a, a big sock of fibrous bark, and then you've got um, you've got a um, upper branches, uh, bare branches. So that's the condition there. So um, just um, look for that uh, in Angophra, either smooth bark or fibrous bark. Next slide. Okay, so I'm just diving straight into species here. This is Angophra hispida, probably a good one to start with. Uh, it's a small Angophra. It's a small tree or mallee, and it's only to about 10 metres tall, spreading to several metres wide. 
Uh, it's got a limited natural distribution in New South Wales, only found in New South Wales, and it's, it's basically in the greater Sydney area, north from around Wollongong, west to Lithgow, north to around Morissette. So Lithgow's up in the Blue Mountains, Morissette is up the north of Sydney, in, uh, sort of the central coast area near, uh, near Gosford there, a bit further on. So it's just an Angophora with a very small range. Uh, it's pretty much confined to sandy areas and sandstone, uh, the Hawkesbury sandstone in the Greater Sydney area. I don't really see it in habitat uh, sort of different to that. You can see the sandstone outcrop here, uh, and it just forms part of dry sclerophyll woodlands, uh, coastal shrubland, and heath. So there's the fruits. Uh, here's the beautiful flowers. Again, you can see they're on the terminals. These nice big flowers. I mean, they're about probably three centimeters across or something like that. They're, they're really nice. Uh, we saw this in lecture one. You just got this conspicuous staminate flower uh, with the carpal in the middle. The main flowering time is probably uh, something like October to January. So uh, what's that? Sort of mid spring to summer. They don't have a booming flowering period every year, but um, they can flower really nicely, especially after fire. And um, some of the eucalypts or a lot of the eucalypts, they don't have definite boom flowering times every year. Sometimes they can put on a really good show every two or three years, but look for this one in, in spring, summer and see if it's doing that. But, you know, they're absolutely beautiful. Uh, just that flower again. So uh, all these stamens surrounding this one carpal, the sepals and the petals are there, but they're hidden. They're just hidden there below. You can see them on these flower buds here. These sepals are going to open and uh, there's probably the petals underneath and they're going to open as well and produce this beautiful flower. These are all flower buds around the outside and that species name Hispida refers to rough hairs. It refers to rough red hairs or rough hairs. So Hispid sort of means covered in hairs which are a bit, bit sort of um, rough and maybe a little bit scabrous. So that's where Angophora Hispida gets its name. It's uh, the pedicels and the peduncles will have the hairs and sometimes the leaf pedioles and the undersides will have the hairs as well. So uh, that's the sort of, what's the word, derivation of that name. I've got some foliage shots. Uh, you can just see here, they're pretty much opposite. They have these sort of broad sort of fatter leaves compared to a lot of other Angophora species. And you can just see here that the leaf base almost sort of clasps onto the stem. You can call that sessile, a sessile leaf where there's hardly any pediole, hardly any stalk that joins the leaf to the stem. But uh, they're quite distinctive, quite nice leaves. This is a garden plant I've got growing. They are used in landscaping. They do do okay in, in some landscapes and uh, being a smallish tree makes them a bit more popular maybe for public areas and landscapers that want to use eucalypts but maybe not use really big ones, which, which I can understand in some areas. Just the underside of the leaf. And gophras normally have this really prominent fine reticulate venation or net-like venation on the underside. So I'm just trying to show that as well. That's just a macro shot with an iPhone, but um, yeah, just look for that nice prominent venation reticulate on the back of Angophora. It's normally quite nice to look at. And just to feature, you can see that the underside of the leaf is a much different shade of green compared to the top side. And a lot of eucalypts have this feature of a paler underside and a darker top side. And a lot of eucalypt species will have uh, uh, additional description thrown in, such as leaves discolorous. So what that means is if they're discolorous, they might say strongly discolorous. They're a much different shade of uh, green on either side. So in Angophora hispida, you might say strongly discolorous. They might be slightly discolorous, where the underside is just a little bit lighter than the top side and some eucalypts they're the same shade of green on each side or the same shade of bluey gray or whatever the leaf color might happen to be they're the same shade and that gets called con colorous so you can have con colorous 
slightly discolorous, mostly concolorous, or strongly discolorous is a lot of the features you get. So I'll point that out now, and maybe I won't have to repeat it in, in the eucalypt lecture, but we've got a pretty strongly discolorous uh, leaf here. So look for that reticulate venation. Uh, you can get these distribution maps. Uh, this is New South Wales Flora Online Plant Net. This is the flora of New South Wales as described by the New South Wales Herbarium, which has now gone online. It used to be printed in four massive Bibles, <laughs> but it's which were $150 each when I was about 20 years old. But it's now online and the books don't get published anymore, obviously. So you can see this is a this is a database of where herbarium specimens have been databased and recorded. There are a lot more records than this made by people with scientific licenses that are put on things like New South Wales Bionet. But if you just want some additional validation that it actually was Angophra hispita recorded, this is the range of where the herbarium specimens have been recorded. What I'll point out quickly is in those flora of New South Wales Bibles, in the first couple of pages, you had a map like this uh, with all the towns and cities on it and, and locations and maybe uh, mountain ranges mapped and, and rivers mapped and all this sort of thing, really good maps. And it shows how New South Wales is broken up into these, what we call these botanical subdivisions. So if you're just thinking about that or you, you, you think you, you, you want to know about that, I'll go through it really quickly. That map in the flora of the New South Wales books, it used to be available online as a JPEG, but in recent times, I haven't been able to find the reliable site that I was getting it from. So I might just have to look into that again. I used to be able to download it as, and surely I've got it saved somewhere as a JPEG. And it's really good when all the towns are mapped on so you can see what botanical subdivision you're in. But maybe if someone knows where you can find that map these days, you can put it in the comments, but I'll, I'll try and have another look for it. But basically we've got uh, the coastal subdivisions and you've got North Coast, Central Coast, south coast and that cc refers to central coast it's only found in central coast areas then you've got the tablelands so separating the coast and the tablelands is normally the mountains such as the blue mountains or the the mountains down here or the northern tablelands so that's where you rise up and go into the upper west of the sort of mountain areas and higher mountain areas so we've got the northern tablelands Central Tablelands, Southern Tablelands, and then you descend off the mountains to the west onto the western slopes. And this is the northwestern slopes, central western slopes, southwestern slopes. And they'll get abbreviations such as NWS, CWS, SWS. And then you go out to the nice flat, almost getting into the pretty much a semi arid, arid country. Uh, northwestern plains, southwestern plains, and north far western plains and south far western plains. SFWP, NFWP, that's how it'll be abbreviated up here. And if Angophora hispida had a much wider range, you'd see them all listed out here. And if it went into state, you'd see those states listed as well, Queensland, Victoria, for example. But Angophora hispida is just confined to this area here. So if we were to find Angophora hispida here or here or maybe here, you definitely want to collect a herbarium specimen, lodge it to the herbarium because you'd have what's called an extension of range. And we're always looking for that as well, trying to uh, illuminate that, you know, geographic ranges might be further than what we know. So if anyone wants to find Angophora hispida around here, definitely want to collect a specimen. It's got to be a natural occurrence. It can't be a planted occurrence, obviously. And you lodge it to the herbarium and you say, you know, there's a, there's another patch of it down here and you get an extension of range. But that's what this map is sort of referring to. It's very helpful just to, if you're trying to identify a eucalypt and you're in this area, well, you know, you can have Angophora um, hispida. Just to show it in a landscape, this is a street tree in uh, South Australia. I'll give this guy a plug. Uh, hopefully I won't get in trouble for using his image, but here's Dean Nicole again, the, the foremost eucalypt expert in Australia. Uh, and this is his website and he's in South Australia. And here's a beautiful Angophora growing as a street tree. As I said, small tree, 
looks like it's been pruned pretty nicely this would be spectacular when it flowers that's a very good example there so check out Dean's site and I've just put in the site I work on the Australian Plant Society plant profile database every time you see that uh, we've got full sort of for the layperson try to have full descriptions of these plants and also how they can be used in horticulture so have a look at that as well uh, if you want these links in the comments so I can put them in so uh, check that out and I just got this photo recently in some coastal coastal heathland in the Royal National Park south of Sydney uh, the ocean is just a couple of hundred meters this way and I'm up on a cliff here in just monitoring a threatened plant but I got in for Hispida in this state again it's sort of in the early fruiting stages but you can see that sunken disc there the same fruits and just the red the the vivid red color with the green it's um, just makes a really nice plant but it's growing on sandstone outcrop again in um, coastal heathland moving on probably to the most popular and gofra in terms of its sort of prominence in the landscape and in horticulture and landscaping now this is the one a lot of people like and gofra costata the smooth barked apple or the sydney red gum look i don't like to call them sydney red gums because we have a whole group of eucalypt species that are red gums and they're very different to these angophras but because of the smooth trunk this is what people will call them i should cover that name of apple as far as i know when the early european colonists or invaders if you like got here uh, the trees because of their branching habit which is often twisted and contorted and sort of undulating they thought they reminded them of apple trees and they, they must have been pining for for old england and, and the homelands because they they don't really look like apple trees but they do have this contorted twisted branching habit it's another good identifying feature for angophora and that's why they get called apples so i tend to call this one the smooth barked apple but you do see it referred to as a sydney red gum it's a very iconic tree in the sydney uh, sandstone country uh, just the fruits again these are a bit immature but uh, there was plenty of these dropping in my backyard just from trees that we have around the place uh, in the last season uh, and just the leaves here very eucalyptus looking uh, long lanceolate this is the adult foliage and you can see this distinctive smooth uh, chunk here and gofra have a very distinctive smooth sort of salmon colored to light brown colored uh, trunk with all these conspicuous sort of dimples uh, I think they're meant to be sort of aborted buds or old buds or you know and probably where those epicormic shoots come out uh, after fire and a lot of the time they have these really broad sort of rounded knobs on them as well especially old trees they're, they're sort of these rounded protrusions of sort of calloused uh, cells I guess maybe where a branch has fallen off or a branch has been aborted uh, they've just got these these typical rounded knobs a lot of the time in especially in bushland and it, it makes them very distinctive so it's a tree to 25 meters tall canopy anywhere to 10 15 meters wide uh, with the twisted undulating branches look for the salmon to light brown color and it's often on sandstone and sandy soils especially the hawkesbury sandstone it can get onto other substrates as well gets onto some enriched shale country too I'm thinking things like sort of blue gum high forest and Sydney turpentine ironbark forest you can get it in those habitats as well but it's really a prominent tree of sandstone areas especially in the greater Sydney area it's got a massive range it goes right up to Townsville in Queensland down to uh, the Melbourne area in Victoria mainly coastal and tablelands it doesn't get too much further inland than that but that's where it gets to uh, so I took some foliage shots yeah this is a typical angophora costata leaf it's got this really prominent what we call transverse venation these red pedioles and even looking at that it's very similar to me to a carimbia leaf to a, a, a leaf like something like carimbia gamifera which we'll look at in in the second uh, the, the next uh, lecture but it's it's just got a real prominent carimbia look to it so again we've got you know 
some things about Carimbia uh, falling in with eucalyptus, but there's some things about Carimbia that fall in with Angophora. And that's where the taxonomic sort of arguments continue as to what's more closely related to what. But they're very Carimbia looking, but they should be opposite. You can see some opposite leaves here. Nice auxiliary bud there. And just this really prominent transverse venation. On the underside, another macro shot. That's had really nice prominent reticulate venation, really fine. It's really attractive to look at. If you look at it with a hand lens or try and get a macro shot with your phone, it's really nice and prominent to look at. I should have had a flowering shot and I just couldn't find one. The Angophora costata in the Sydney area in the last season, October, November 2023, had a really awesome flowering period. Everyone was posting them online and just going sort of orgasmic over the beautiful Angophoras. Uh, like I said, they just get covered in white flowers on the terminals. It sort of looks like they've had a dusting of um, either snow or mashed potato or cauliflower. It's it just got that look to it. Really nice. Flying foxes were all over them at night. Insects are all over them during the day. But this is a flowering shot. Uh, again, like Angophora hispida, they, they're sort of the flowers aren't quite as big in terms of diameter, but trees just get covered in these flowers. I've, I've got to have a decent shot somewhere, but I just couldn't find it for this lecture. But they just had a really beautiful flowering period in Sydney, and there's just hundreds of fruits now, fallen fruits uh, on the ground. I'm constantly cleaning them up in my own backyard. But uh, there's, yeah, they're, they're a beautiful flowering tree. Again, October to January is the main time. Just uh, on that New South Wales Flora online website, you can click a secondary link under the map and you can go onto the Australasian Virtual Herbarium. So this will give you a whole Australian coverage. So that's where trees have been collected for herbarium specimens. You got a nice disjunct population in the Melbourne, Victoria area. And you got a few disjunct populations up here. It gets very interesting when you can see that this is the main sort of thrust of the population, but then you get these disjunct patches. And it's highly unlikely that these trees are sort of breeding with these trees. So they, they might be coming a, you know, a subspecies through time, but that's the whole occurrence. Very interesting um, disjunctions. These trees here, when you got them in major cities in these states, this would just be collections of trees probably growing in botanic gardens or cultivated specimens that have been turned into herbarium specimens. But definitely natural populations here and here. What's very interesting is New Zealand is covered in it. Um, as far as I could research, it's not natural in New Zealand. It's been planted everywhere and it might have become weeds or weedy in certain cases. But someone's done a very good study in New Zealand uh, and turned all these into herbarium specimens. So it's growing well and truly in New Zealand as well, but it's not meant to be natural there. It's, um, it's just been bought in and cultivated. Looks like pretty uh, popular in, in a popular fashion <laughs> as well. But that's sort of the main general thrust of the population. Uh, just some shots, some really nice shots. Uh, typical Hawkesbury uh, sandstone gully country in Greater Sydney. And these are your beautiful uh, salmon trunks. It's not the only tree growing in this habitat. It's co-dominant with a Carimbia and it's co-dominant with a couple of eucalypt species. But this is typical Angophora costata country. Here we are at another site, Greater Sydney, above the sandstone gullies. This is more on the ridges. And you've got these beautiful Angophoras here. You see all those dimples. And again, co-dominant with uh, other eucalypts, as well as things like Carimbia gamifera. Where's my clicker? This is a really grandiose stand. This was taken uh, just around Sydney Harbour. So this is a bushland reserve pretty much on Sydney Harbour in Wollstonecraft. Uh, on the north side, I think, and uh, we just got this beautiful grandiose canopy of uh, Angophora costata. Just had to uh, do some survey of this vegetation. There were some other eucalyptus species there, but it was so dominant and just such a prominent Sydney um, shot when you're on the sandstone country there. 
I really wish this photo was better. I, I really can't understand why it's only about 200 kilobytes in size. I, I took it on an early digital camera in about 2007 or thereabouts. But uh, this was just a beautiful gully in the south of Sydney that I checked to one day well and truly off track. You've got all these beautiful Gaimere lilies and then you've got these beautiful Angophicos starters on sandstone. It was just this magical um, gully. It's a really typical... Sydney sandstone gully forest that people like. So Angophicos starter, full of Gaimere lilies underneath. I wish that photo was better, but it's not. But that was a really nice uh, shot. In 2017, during some poor weather, a huge Angophicos starter, which would have been remnant, came crashing down on our house. Came through the kitchen roof. So that's just an example of the damage they can do. Um, so again, Beautiful tree. It was growing with another tree that remained upright, but the twin sort of it was sort of a twin tree. Down really slowly, crack, 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 and just gained a bit of speed and then landed on the roof. Uh, big cleanup job, a lot of insurance, uh, a lot of damage, uh, but we got there in the end. But uh, yeah, pretty stressful moment. And here's one further down the street, uh, which I just had to photograph. I reckon this tree would be possibly 200 years old it's always hard to tell but it's been sitting here we know for decades at least and when my boys were a lot younger I got them to stand there and just it, it just had this flange sort of callousing on the trunk here and this was getting to almost about two meters across so it's not very tall it's only about 25 meters but it's very old and it's taken a lot of damage it's got all this beautiful sort of mosaic dead material a lot of hollows for cockatoos, really old, precious street tree. Uh, and it's just got this uh, massive chunk. Uh, I've hardly seen an Angophicos starter with a chunk like that. But you can see that beautiful, uh, smooth bark as well. Uh, those beautiful salmon colours. So I hope that tree hangs around for a while. It's a real beautiful one. And here I've seen it growing as a mallee. Uh, in the Royal National Park, close to the ocean again. So just saying Gophicos started growing uh, as what we call a mallee on sandy sandstone country uh, can do this as well. So um, if you could get it growing like this in your garden, you'd be pretty happy with it as well. I have seen Angophicos starter used by bonsai practitioners to very good and beautiful effect. Uh, if you ever see one in a bonsai collection, they're absolutely beautiful. Um, so yeah, they, they do bonsai themselves like that in a, in a Mallee sort of form. So that's uh, in the Royal National Park, I think, south of Sydney. There's a link again to the plant database I work on. And here is what I was talking about in lecture one. Here's an example of epicormic growth after fire. So Angophricos starter will readily do this, no problems. So we've had a fire, not too severe but the ground layer got well and surely burnt it was a deliberate fire in the gary area in the royal national park but this is what angophicos starter will do about four uh, can be two or three four weeks after fire they'll put on these beautiful epicormic uh, shoots uh, here it might be a combination of lignotuba and epicormic and when they start off they're this nice red color and apparently they're full of possibly some poisonous secondary metabolites that sort of stops animals eating them so they can get going and allow the tree to photosynthesize again but again if you can go bushwalking after a bushfire you can capture some really good shots like this and it just gives you more knowledge on what the plants are able to do but angophicos starter it has no problem doing this uh, at all just after a fire so that was Angophicos starter. Uh, due to a very similar species that you can find, I've quickly thrown this in. This is Angophra leocarpa, which used to be a subspecies of Angophicos starter. But you find this in really far or well and truly inland areas of New South Wales. And you can be driving along the road in the, in the northern parts of the state. And you go, oh, wow, that's Angophicos starter on the side of the road. But it's actually Angophra leocarpa. It has most of the same features, but the fruits are a little bit smaller and the leaves are a bit narrower and smaller. But it's an inland species on sandstone and sandy soils. And if you look at the map, it's found here in New South Wales around the Narrabri area. 
and I've sort of seen it along the road to Yetman here. If you drive from sort of Tenterfield to Yetman, plenty of it on the side of the road. Um, it goes into Queensland again. What would be interesting and what can happen here is um, a long-term history of possibly collections of Angophricos starter being mistaken for Leo Carpa or vice versa. And I would think a lot of these coastal occurrences would be Angophricos starter, but they're all herbarium specimens anyway. But in New South Wales, it's meant to sort of occur in this inland, what we call the northwestern slopes area. Uh, that's that's where we find it generally, but I'm not sure what's going on in Queensland where you find it right next to the coast here. But anyway, that's how they've been um, databased. Up to about the Rockhampton latitude, yes, yeah, is where it sort of grows. Uh, so it's a bit of an inland uh, version of Angophricos starter. So look out for that if you're out that way. And then I'll get on to Angophra floribunda. This is a very, very common Angophra that you find over large parts of New South Wales, uh, eastern Victoria, and into central Queensland. It can rock up in a lot of habitats. Um, it's on a range of soil types. I've seen it on sand dunes, uh, sandstone or sand deposits. Yes, um, sedimentary sandstone. It'll be on alluvium. It's a real uh, strong component of creek lines in inland New South Wales. It loves growing on creeks. Uh, I've seen it on shale soils, uh, conglomerate as well. So um, a really common component. It doesn't seem to be too fussy about where it grows. Uh, it can get up to 30 metres tall to about 15 metres wide. It's got a full length fibrous brown trunk, very different to ang Angophricos starter. And again, that, the nature of that fibrous trunk, it's, it's a bit like a mahogany eucalypt. It's not really like a stringy bark and not, not at all like an iron bark, but it's, it's more like a mahogany. You can sort of take bits of the bark off, but it's a bit of a struggle to do so. But it just reminds me of some of the mahogany eucalypts like Eucalyptus resinifera. So that's a, that's a whole stand of Angophra floribunda there uh, in, the, in the sort of Hunter Valley of New South Wales. Uh, just, a, just a whole sort of coppicing stand of it. Where you get Angophra floribunda, you tend to get a lot of seedlings regenerating as well. It does a really good job of regenerating, especially along farmland creek lines and places like that in the inner parts of uh, New South Wales. Uh, that's just a map again. It's got a massive distribution. It's more coastal down here in the south of New South Wales and eastern Victoria, but there's also some natural populations here, and I'm not sure what's going on there. Very disjunct, but apparently it grows there as well as far as I've researched. And then as you get into the warmer parts of Australia, it tends to sort of branch out into the inland with some disjunctions up here. So it's got a very large range. A lot of habitats in that range. Mainly dry sclerophyll uh, woodland will be the main habitat. It, it doesn't really get into rainforest or the edge of rainforest. It tends to like the drier country. Uh, there's a big grandiose example. Uh, you know, a canopy to about probably 10 metres wide and a tree probably about 20 metres tall. You can see the contorted branching habit. And I don't have photos of everything, I should, but here's someone else's photo I've got permission to use. Flowers on the terminals, nice uh, buds here. They look very nice when they flower. The flowers are a fair bit smaller to Angophra hispida and maybe Angophra costata as well. They're just a bit smaller in diameter, but you can see the flowers on the terminals there. Uh, leaves like Angophra costata, they're normally a bit narrower and a bit shorter. And on the back, they have really prominent reticulate venation. That's very identifiable once you get familiar with it. The underside of the leaf is also a nice sort of blue-green colour, like a real greeny blue, very different to sort of the mid-green top side. So look at the underside of the leaves, and they've got a nice bluey green, really pale colour with reticulate venation. And just some fruits here. Again, it's from Dean Nicole. Uh, these are the fruits of Angophra floribunda. And what uh, Dean says about them, and, and I won't argue with him at all, is these fruits tend to be a bit less woody and a lot more papery. So you can almost put them between your thumb and forefinger and crush them. You can try and sort of give them a crush. 
and they've got a bit of a papery sort of plywood uh, texture, not really hardly woody like some of the Carimbia fruits. So these Angophora fruits are a bit more papery. Uh, try and put them between your fingers, see if you can crush them. They're not sort of very tough at all, just, just a bit more on the soft side. But you can see the ribs again and the sepal teeth and the seeds in there are going to pop out you know, through the valves, uh, sort of sunken there in the in the top of the top of the fruit. So I'll I'll try and acquire some some better photos as I go through for Engofro. Yeah. So look, that about wraps it up. I've uh, hit 40 minutes, so I've got to pull it up. So there are some others. There's Engofra subvelutina. That's like Angophora floribunda, but it has these really strong sessile leaves. And when you look at the canopy, you can tell that it is subvelutina just because of the look of the chunk, which is like floribunda. But it's got these really prominent stem clasping leaves, uh, which are sort of chordate or triangular in shape almost. Uh, subvelutina likes to grow on a lot of broad floodplains and alluvial sort of creek lines, a very distinctive Angophora. You can get Angophora bakeri, that looks like Angophora floribunda, it's very common, but it's generally a smaller tree, but it has narrower leaves. It's got these very narrow prominent leaves, uh, maybe to about 10 mil wide as a maximum. And that grows on a lot of sandstone ridge top country, especially around Sydney and sandstone shale country um, around Sydney as well and further afield. But that's Angophora bakeri, normally about 10, 15 metres tall, really narrow leaves. And just throwing in that we have species like Angophora rober, Exul and Ina pina that are listed as threatened in New South Wales. So even though we've only got about 10, 13 species, we have some that are listed as threatened. And that's because they've just got really small geographic ranges. I think... Uh, the people who consider only 10 species, I think they think that these two are pretty much the same, even though they grow in different areas. But morphologically, they're very similar and they do have trunks like Angophora floribunda. But we do have some threatened species uh, in the Angophora. We've got a lot of threatened eucalypts as well, but that's understandable when there's about 700 species. But uh, the Angophoras are really important because we do have some threatened species in there. All right, I'll cap it off there. Thanks again for tuning in. The next lecture three will be on Carimbia and hopefully I'll, um, you can tune into that one.